hello, and welcome to our second episode of the new Rampage podcast, Rams on the Air. I'm Benjamin Kushner. I'm your host for today, and I'm one of the copy editors on the paper. I'm so excited to introduce our guest for today. He's an award-winning TV and multimedia producer, an author, a historian, and a public speaker. He's the author of Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Lady. A warm welcome to the First Lady's man himself, Mr. Andrew Oak. Hey, Ben, it's nice to be here with you. All right, so sort of the elephant in the room during this time is, of course, unrelated to First Ladies, it's the coronavirus, so I feel obliged as the host just to ask you, you know, how are you doing? Are you managing to stay safe, stay healthy, all of those things? Yeah, well, I appreciate you asking. Um, My routine and the way I've operated as the First Ladies man and as a television producer and historian, it's a lot of travel. With a, as a public speaker, that is also a lot of travel. So professionally, a lot of events have been canceled, and I understand that. But book sales are still, you know, everyone's looking for more books to read. So I've been very busy and safely shipping books through the United States Postal Service. I live kind of out in the country in Shadyside, Maryland, and I've been heading out on my motorcycle and, and having a good time with that and enjoying the, uh, the outdoors as most people are discovering or rediscovering. And, uh, and staying safe and just trying to be a responsible citizen, do the right thing until we can get back on the other side. And I, I hope that, uh, that you are staying safe as well. And I feel for all the students whose uh, school year has been disrupted. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, it's definitely been a change that it, it's caused all of us to have to make some changes to our lives. So I think that we ought to just jump right into it. So before we start talking about First Ladies, which will be the bulk of the episode, I want to start by just talking about you a little bit. So can you tell us about your journey from the from the halls of Rockville High School up until like right around when you started studying First Ladies? Yeah, you know, I started off with a with an interest in photography. I took photography with Penny Umble. I was actually her teacher's aide as well at Rockville High School. And that sort of trickled into my journalism interest and being on the rampage with the great Kevin Keegan, won some awards there and became a photo editor. And then my natural interest in writing, which I've always had, got me to write some articles and, and, and things like that for the Rampage, in addition to the photographic work that I did. I've also been a drummer since the age seven. And so I've always played in a band, been musical or produced music, written music, recorded music, toured in a band for a while. And so you take all of those sort of creative elements, and that put me at University of Maryland with a radio, television, and film degree. There I gravitated once again towards the writing of things, the marketing of things, the advertising of things, all of which came in handy to market and advertise and and promote my bands throughout the years as we toured and played and even fun bands that I still play in off to the side, cover bands, other things like that. But when I when I landed producer series producer title for C-SPAN for the 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 First Lady's influence and image, that came after a long a long number of years honing my my news skills, my writing skills, my video skills, my photography skills, my multimedia skills, everything that I'd learned and 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 just again that came fairly naturally to me. I'm not a I'm not a math guy. I'm not an accounting guy. I'm not a figures guy. I'm 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 more that creative side of my brain. And so all of that writing and interest in news and being in Washington, DC and being around politics and traveling with presidents and ambassadors and internationally and nationally landed me that role as series producer for First Lady's influence and image. And these women just spoke to me in a way no other group of of humans has spoken to me prior to that. And it just I popped out the backside of the project, just retaining all the information and becoming the first ladies man. I always joke. I say it's it's all about the ladies and and they made me the first ladies man. But they they really did. I didn't go into the project thinking I was going to write a book and I was going to do public speaking and I was going to be this first ladies man. It was it was them, all of them and their stories that created me. I'm just a, a vessel, all, albeit unlikely, uh, for this, this type of information about, about these women. Let's talk about the book a little bit. Of course, you had sort of the information from the First Lady's influence and image um, from that series. So what was sort of your process of taking that information and 
condensing it into a book and making that and making the book the most readable for readers and have the the readers be able to digest the story in the best possible way. Sure. It's it's funny that you use the word condense the material. What I actually did was the exact opposite. I expanded the material. What I did for that series was for a year and two months, very short amount of time to put together a series as extensive as the series was. And traveling by myself was was just a r- ridiculously Herculean effort of lack of, of it just C-SPAN just doesn't have a big budget for stuff like this. And the production value isn't like, you know, we're not making Schindler's List or, or Raiders of the Lost Ark here. So it was something that I could handle with one camera, a couple of microphones and some lights. But typically to put together a series like that, you would have a staff of anywhere between five and 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 25 people to do what it was that, that I did to then bring back to Washington where the rest of the staff could put together the shows. I was just one element of the shows. It was the the video pieces that took you outside of the studio, outside of Washington, D.C., to show you about these women's lives before, during, and after the White House. But I would spend all day at a location, and I went to every library, church, home, school, cemetery, birthplace, train station, general store related to these women. So I would spend six, eight, ten hours at a location and bring back hours and hours of footage that would condense down to three or four two-minute pieces. So there was so much extra material after the series was over, that's when I wanted to go out and speak publicly about it because there was still so much to tell, so much to learn, and there was so much interest. People seemed to be more interested in this project than any other project I'd done, and I'd, I'd done some pretty cool, fun stuff as a television producer. So that amazed me, too, that there was this thirst for this knowledge. And then thinking in a 45 to 50 or an hour long speech, you can only talk about so much. But there was still so much to tell. So what I did was the way the book came down was that the book now tells every single story, every single experience about every single first lady from Martha Washington through Ida McKinley in in volume one. And then volume two is Edith Roosevelt through Melania Trump. Um, It expands these stories and tells everything that I couldn't fit into a one hour or 45 minute speech. So these books are really the full story as I experienced and as I researched it. To make it readable in my process, I just wrote how I speak. You know, I just sat down at the computer. I started with Martha Washington and I finished with Melania Trump. And people seem to be really enjoying it. All right. So you mentioned, you know, all of these experiences, all of these stories that these first ladies have. If you could choose one story, one specific story about one specific first lady that you think people don't know and that you think people need to know, what would that be? Yeah, I, that's a that's a great question, Ben, and and I get to questions a lot of who's your favorite first lady in this, and obviously when you've seen as much and you know as much and you've been to as many places as me, it's impossible to pick just one because these these first ladies truly did each and every one of them. There's some gem, some hidden something, and the majority, if not all of them, affect our modern world. Without the U.S., the world is a different place. Without American presidents, the world is a different place. And thus, without the first lady who helped influence and be part of their lives, the modern world looks completely different without these women and without America. But picking just one, it's a first lady that most people wouldn't name if they could name 5, 10, 15, 20 first ladies. And even if they know this about, if they know this first lady, they don't know this story. And that's Lou Hoover. Um, Lou Hoover is one of the most remarkable first ladies, uh, one of the f- remarkable human beings, uh, and 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 truly one of the most capable human beings that ever lived in the White House. And that's that's you know first lady or president. And what she and President Hoover did long before they were president and first lady, uh, right at the outbreak of World War One, they were in London mining pewter. They were both geology majors from Stanford University. That's actually where they met in geology class. And they traveled the world together, mining precious gems and minerals, and and that's where they made their fortune. They're self-made millionaires. And what they did selflessly with their own money to help get uh, American diplomats, expats, uh, their wives and children, family members out of Europe, out of London, before the world before World War One really got uh, aggressive. They they got people out of, out of there and got them into safe houses 
when the, the U.S. government couldn't. The U.S. government couldn't act fast enough and didn't have the money and the resources to get the people out. The Hoovers wrote personal checks to get people out of this bad situation and back to the states where they would be safe during World War I. And that's just one example of the selfless efforts of, of these two human beings to just do better for the world because they could. They didn't ask for repayment. They didn't ask for accolades. They didn't ask for rewards, recognition. They did it because it was the right thing to do. And taking that example in your own everyday life is just one way we can be unusual for our time, which is the title of my book and speaking series. And, and the Hoovers, is specifically Mrs. Hoover, Lou Hoover, exemplify that. So, um. That's a very interesting story, and it wasn't one that I knew. It's not something that, you know, I've been taught in history classes or whatever. So exactly. a follow-up question is, why do so many of these amazing stories about these absolutely pivotal figures in our country, why do they get sort of lost in the annals of history? Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. And when I went to each of these places, now, keep in mind, every every presidential library and museum from the Hoovers up until President George George W. Bush is operated by the National Archives and Records Administration. The historical sites are run by the National Park Service. So these are federally funded and operated institutions. And when I went to each of these locations, they all were kind of put on their side a little bit. They weren't used to talking about these places and these artifacts with the first ladies being at the head of the story. It's just the way our culture, our, our male-driven culture, our patriarchal society, the way uh, the modern world functions. But in respect to, to gender equality and gender relations, it's something that we've struggled with from the very, very beginning of our country when they came over as colonists, you know, how women were treated and, and, and what to do with the women's vote and, and suffrage movement and, and ERA, uh, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment, which we still struggle with today, equal pay and all the other stuff. So it's just that system and the way it's designed that we don't function on these women or think about these women as their own entity. Uh, again, that's changing. We're making great strides, strides and great progress in that, but it's just not a perspective that we teach and we're used to. And and people's eyes are are getting pretty wide open when they hear my speeches and they read these books ab about how incredible and how influential these women are. And I, I couldn't be happier about it because it's it's an important message for men, women, boys, girls, young, old. It really doesn't matter. These women have been right there, not as this subset of their husbands as equals. They've been right there contributing from the very beginning. And it's not a matter of whether we're letting women in the room to, to be these leaders. They've always been in the room. We just have to recognize them and recognize that they were there. So let's talk about one of the first women that was in this room. In fact, the very first when it comes to first ladies, Martha Washington. I imagine that she did a lot to sort of define what the role of first lady would become. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, she did. And she also did a lot to define what our country would become. You know, I grew up in Rockville, Maryland, went to Rockville High School, went to University of Maryland. My access to the Smithsonian and all of our country's history from Washington, D.C., readily accessible. Uh, Williamsburg, my fifth grade trip, I went to Williamsburg and Bush Gardens, as many Montgomery County kids do. And I, I never knew just how important Martha Washington was to the Revolutionary War. George Washington married up. She was in higher social standing at a higher financial position than, than George Washington. And when he married her, he gained over 8,000 acres of productive tobacco land outside of Williamsburg. She had probably four to five times the governor's annual salary, the Virginia governor's annual salary. She had four to five times his annual salary cash on hand. She owned about a quarter of the real estate in Williamsburg. She had married up and her first husband died very, very, very young, but left her a very, very wealthy woman. And if, if she was not able to manage all this wealth, even possess all this wealth, then George would have had to manage it or generate that wealth himself. So just by marrying her, George Washington puts himself in a position where he can even start this revolution. Because if Martha wasn't taking care of everything at home, 
George would have to do that. If George couldn't do it, George couldn't go riding up and down the East Coast fighting the Redcoats and strategizing. I, I mean, a brilliant military mind and, a, and a, the revolutionaries revolutionary for sure. His even concept of America and diplomacy, uh, legendary. But if Martha Washington didn't have things locked down at home, then he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. In addition to that, at each of the winter encampments, and this is where we start to see that role of first lady forming. She's the first lady. She's the wife of the general who is leading the revolution against the global world power at the time, the king and queen of, of England. This is incredible. So what she starts doing is she starts entertaining and politicking and doing things to be think of Martha Washington when she was a widow from her first husband as the first successful female CEO of the colonies of the new world and and that is no that is no small statement so when this woman gets with George Washington and his ideas what she formulates to help him do what he does he writes in letters he says I don't think straight without my wife at my side. She went at great personal risk to nearly every winter encampment to host parties. And it wasn't just parties where people are dancing and drinking and having a good time. These are meetings. These are strategy. She would have people over to, to his winter encampments that were funding the revolution, uh, French generals and diplomats and officials, other generals in other regiments of the Revolutionary War. Uh, she would have to organize the food, the, 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 the ceremonies, the paintings that would have to be commissioned, the religious ceremonies, the plays, all of the things that went into this politicking and this strategy was all done by her. And that rolls right over into the first first lady role when she was in the first executive mansion in New York City, the second executive mansion in Philadelphia, where she would start to put in protocols and, and social gatherings and things that would be the politicking of the day. All right. So I so moving a little bit farther down the line into the sure. very early 1900s, um, I, I personally have a favorite first lady, and that would be Helen Taft. And, oh, wow. Um, William Howard Taft once joked that without his wife, he would still be languishing on a circuit court in Cleveland. And so I just want you to, um, if you could just talk a little bit about Helen Taft, what her contributions were to the country, and just how she served as that prime motivator behind William. Sure. I, that's a very, very interesting favorite first lady for you to have as that is another first lady that most people wouldn't name or, or know. And, and William Taft was correct. He would not be where he was had it not been for her wife. Helen Herron, her, her maiden name, she had a very, I mean, you know, you go on spring break as, as, a, as a young man. I went on spring break. We go to camp. We have summer vacation when we're in school. Our parents ship us off to our aunt and uncles who live at the beach so they can have a break from us. We can all get our vacations and things like that. Well, things weren't much different back when Helen was a teenager and Helen was sent to go visit her her father's former law partner for uh, when she had a break in school. Now, her Mr. Heron's former law partner happened to be then President Rutherford B. Hayes. So Helen Heron was sent to basically have spring break or summer break at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in the White House. Helen Heron walked around as a teenager living in the White House for a few weeks and thought, I could get used to this. I want to marry a man who would become president. And she's not the only first lady to, to do that or aspire to that. Uh, Mary Lincoln said she was courted by, by uh, Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy, who would become the Confederate president. And she said in a letter that Abraham Lincoln isn't the best looking guy in town, but he's going to be president one day. So I'm hitching my wagon to his horse. I mean, it's just these women, these women of, of natural aptitude and intelligence and desire and wanting to make their mark on the world because women couldn't vote. Women couldn't inherit money legally and care for them. The, you know, the, the money that Martha Dandridge inherited from her first husband before she came Martha Washington, she was just procuring that and protecting it for her sons. You know, women couldn't own land. Women didn't have educations. Women didn't have jobs. Women couldn't vote. So if you had this aspiration and this natural aptitude as a woman, you would find a man who was on his way somewhere. And that's what Helen Heron found in William Taft. All Taft wanted to do was be 
a Supreme Court justice and be a judge and be on the court. Loved lawyering, loved all that. So he was tapped by um, Taft was tapped by McKinley at the time. And he said, McKinley, President McKinley said, Willie, go over to the Philippines and fix this problem. Because the U.S. was trying to help the Philippines get out of uh, post-war depression and, and all kind of stuff like that. And a General MacArthur was over there really making a mess of things. So uh, McKinley said, Taft, go fix this. So, and when you come back, I'll make you Supreme Court justice. Great. So Taft packs up uh, Helen and his kids and they go over to the Philippines. They, they do a bang up job. They just, the Filipinos loved the Tafts. They threw great parties. They included them in the structure, restructuring of the government. They listened to them. They gave the, the native people a, a voice there, the people of that country a voice, and they couldn't have done a better job. Well, McKinley was assassinated. And so along with McKinley died Taft's guarantee to be Supreme Court justice. So he said to the new president and the new Republican Party at the time, he said, hey, I was going to be Supreme Court justice. They're like, yeah, well, too bad. We know nothing about that deal. Then Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, who was McKinley's vice president, who inherited the presidency through assassination, decided that he wasn't going to run for a third term. And the Republicans tapped none other than William H. Taft and his wife pushing him the whole way to say, you're doing this, you're going for this. He said, well, what about my Supreme Court seat? And they said, well, it looks like you're going to have to be president first, which he was. And then he became a U.S. Supreme Court uh, justice. And the rest, as you know, as we say, is history. But she was so instrumental and had wanted that from from the age of a young girl. And she becomes the first first lady to ride in the carriage back to the Capitol with her husband. She, um, the first first lady buried in Arlington National Cemetery because her husband was buried there. She outlived her husband, as many first ladies do, and she had him buried in Washington, D.C. because he achieved that final goal, that Supreme Court uh, seat, and then she followed him there in Arlington. And now here's something about Helen Taft. You may know this. I certainly didn't know it. It's not widely known or, or broadcast. She donated the first inaugural gown to the Smithsonian's First Ladies Dresses collection. This is so huge because when you ask the world over, 95% of the rooms I speak in, 98% of the time I ask the question, what's the first thing you think of when you think of First Ladies? And the number one answer is dresses. The reason we think of dresses is because of the Smithsonian Institution exhibit and the reason there's a dress in there is because when the first exhibit was going up, the two women that were organizing it asked the sitting first lady, Helen Taft, can we have something of yours for this exhibit on women and first ladies? She gave them their, her inaugural gown. She could have given them anything in the world that was hers. She gave them the gown. Every either Either retroactively we've gone back or since her, we have a dress or an inaugural gown that represents every first lady in the United States, including the current Melania Trump, because of Helen Taft. Oh, she also planted the first cherry blossom tree in Washington, D.C. So just a, a wildly influential first lady who influenced the, the, what we think of and see when we, when we come to the nation's, nation's capital in cherry blossom trees and what we think of with first ladies in their dresses. All right. And then moving on to the next administration after the Tafts, we had the Wilsons. And of course, Woodrow Wilson was married to Ellen Wilson for the start of his presidency. And then she passed on the role of first lady, briefly passed to his daughter. But then he started courting Edith Wilson and they eventually got married. And she is one of the most incredible women in American history because she essentially ran the government after Wilson's stroke. So can you talk a little bit about that and just what her role was in the late Wilson administration? Sure. You know, and, and then not to forget Ellen Wilson, to briefly mention, she is the inspiration, the original designer of the Rose Garden. And not a, not a week goes by, barely a day, where we don't see the president, any president, in the Rose Garden with us, with us making some speech or, or a, uh, you know, address to the, to the nation, to the public, to the press, with a foreign dignitary or someone back there, and and she she wanted to duplicate replicate her garden from Princeton University, where they were president and first lady of Princeton at the uh, Prospect House, and she brought the White House gardener up to 
Princeton to see her garden there, to duplicate it at the White House so the president could look out and see equal beauty. And that's why we have the White House. Um, Edith Wilson's story is very interesting as well. She's from a tiny town. Uh, you can drive there very easily down 83 and get to Withville, Virginia. But Edith's parents, Edith Bowling's parents, did not like a boyfriend she had in town. He was an older man. They didn't like him, and they wanted Edith to separate herself from him. So they sent Edith to Washington, D.C. to spend time over the summer with her sister, who had already gotten married and moved to the big city. Well, while Edith was there, she fell in love with another man, Mr. Galt. He was a jeweler, and they got married and stayed in Washington, D.C., where he was very successful, cosmopolitan, ritzy uh, jeweler. And he died around about the same time that Ellen Wilson died. And then mutual friends set the president up with Edith Wilson, and they, they were married. It's the last of three first ladies to die in the White House, uh, Ellen Wilson was, and the, the last U.S. president to remarry uh, in office uh, having lost his his wife, and and you know hopefully we don't lose any more first ladies ever in the in the White House. I don't wish that on anyone. But Edith and Woodrow were so close, and she was so naturally smart that even before his stroke, they would have they had this box, and this box it was a glorified you know inbox outbox. It's a metal and wooden tray with drawers, and the and the papers of the day would go into this drawer. New business, old business, you know, business on hold. It was all separated out. And and Woodrow and Edith would grab this box with a handle on top and go upstairs to the residence at the White House where they would sit and go over the day's business. She was his number two. You know, his vice president was not his number two. Members of his administration were not his number two. This was the Edith and Woodrow show. So when he had a stroke, she put a strict rule that no one, not one person was allowed into the president's bedroom without her permission. And I've been to the Woodrow Wilson Museum in Stanton, Virginia. I've seen the documents from the doctor, the personal, personal and White House doctor of Woodrow and Edith Wilson. I've seen things that she signed. I've seen, you know, she says uh, or said that nothing was done without the president's knowledge. Nothing was done without the president's instruction. But I mean, the guy had a stroke that kept him out of the public eye for six months. The Congress didn't know that he had a stroke. The public didn't know that he had a stroke. They issued uh, staged and fake interviews through the press that made him look that he was still active and doing all this stuff. It was a total flim flam. I, they would, I mean, there's no way you could pull this off today. They pulled it off brilliantly. And she, in all, even if she did have the president's sign off or stamp of approval on every bit of administrative work that came out of his bedroom, she still determined when that information went to him, when it would be presented to him. So that is a presidential act right there. That is that is that is sifting through her. And, you know, they the, Wilson and, and his wife told the told the country that he was suffering from exhaustion and he received a number of letters offering services. Uh, one letter said, you know, I didn't even vote for the president, but my wife's church group would sure love to come and sing for him. One husband offered up his wife as a masseuse said she was a physical therapist masseuse and, and wanted his wife to go to the White House to give him a massage, to help him with his exhaustion and stuff. I mean, the whole, everyone bought this and Wilson was about to retire. This is what most people don't know. And there's a letter and I've held it and I've read it. And one administration member is talking to the doctor and he said, I'd like to hear more about the president's decision to retire in front of Congress. He was gonna be wheeled out in his wheelchair. And the doctor, Wilson's doctor said, Wilson's plan to retire does not please Mrs. Wilson. So we have to come up with another plan. Mrs. Wilson's thoughts were that if the president had the presidency to sort of prop him up and he had to finish this job as president and not retire, he would live longer. She was right. He did. And he was able to finish his second term. And then they moved into the house that they bought in Georgetown, which I recommend going to Highly, it, it beautiful, beautiful, beautiful brownstone. In it looks like they just walked out the door because Edith goes on to live so long, and and she they both died there in the house. And it it literally, it looks like your grandparents' house. Like they just walked out to go to the store, and they're going to come back at any minute. But Edith Wilson did 
prolong his life and keep him alive so he could retire with dignity, go to the house in, in Washington, in Georgetown, and, and basically die in peace there. But she was she was 100 percent a significant piece of the of the presidential role during during uh, Wilson's stroke. So I want to move on to modern, modern day, because we've we have Melania Trump um, in the east wing of the White House now. Michelle Obama obviously recently left after the 2016 election. So could you just so what's unique about Melania and Michelle is that they both were first lady when social media was around. And I imagine that this has been a huge change in how people, you know, present themselves and how people, especially people that are so admired, people that are looked up to by large segments of the population, this must be a huge change in sort of the role of First Lady. So can you just talk a little bit about social media and how that affected the First Ladyships of Melania and Michelle? Uh, ben, you're hired. You're hired by First Ladies Man Enterprises. A remarkably astute question. Uh, so much so that I get asked a lot of times, you know, about modern times and how the role of first ladies have changed. And I have not heard anyone come up with this on their own. But when I say it, people have that aha moment. And you hit the nail on the head. Melania Trump and Michelle Obama have a distinct thing in common. And it's both a good thing and a bad thing. But they are the first two social media first ladies. Now, what we can trace back to, and this is you know, I'm not the end all be all by any stretch of the imagination, but my research is pretty deep. My knowledge is pretty vast. And I talk to a lot of different people in a lot of different arenas. That being said, the last first lady in the United States of America who people had very, very different opinions of her husband, a polarizing individual, you could say, as as all presidents and politicians seem to be, people are just picking their, their sides. But the last first lady that basically everyone loved, even if they didn't love her husband, was Laura Bush. The difference between Laura Bush and Michelle Obama from 30,000 feet, you know, in the role of first lady is social media. What social media does is it allows people to sit very safely and quietly and uninterrupted and uncorroborated and unsubstantiated in their homes and post opinions as though they were fact. They can also say very, very mean things. And people, they don't have to be face to face with the person when they say it. They said horrible things about Michelle Obama, horrible, untrue things, made videos that, you know, with the technology, you can alter videos, you can make your own YouTube channel, you can do everything you want, and you can things in Wikipedia or on a website or write some book full of nonsense, and it can be taken 100% without sourcing it or corroborating it as fact, and it's not. So when people liked George W. Bush, typically they also liked his wife. When people didn't like George W. Bush or the things he was doing or his administration, they still liked Laura Bush, and they liked the things that she was doing. If you don't like President Obama, chances are you do not like his wife, even though who the heck would think that it's a bad thing to get kids to exercise and be healthy? Yet you're still going to say horrible things about this woman or say she has no idea what she's doing. I mean, these first ladies typically give selflessly to an agenda that is often geared towards children or young people, but promoting health, promoting good intentions love all the all the humanity of being a human is embodied in that first lady they rarely go political you know, of course hillary clinton is a different story and she's in a category kind of all by herself you know once you get into the political arena and you start running for elected office but keep in mind these women are unelected and unpaid they are probably the most influential unelected and unpaid women in the world yet we treat them as if we pay them. There's no job description. There, is no, there are no rules. 
They don't even have to do it over the years. There have been a number. You mentioned one in between the Wilson marriage, in between his two wives. His daughter handled the role of first lady. Thomas Jefferson, our third president of the United States, had no wife. We had no traditional first lady. For 12 years between the uh, Andrew Jackson administration and the Martin Van Buren administration, no woman married to a president. Both were widowers, and they had nieces and daughter-in-laws as their first ladies. So a wife of a president doesn't even have to accept the role of first lady. And now with this social media, they get endlessly criticized and endlessly celebrated. I mean, if you're if you're a fan, you've got that vehicle. And I think even especially very recently within the past year or so, Melania Trump has stepped up her social media game incredibly. Her videos are well produced. Her information and content is great and regular. And Michelle Obama, even now in this COVID environment, she's reading to children on Mondays and she started her own production company for a YouTube channel and stuff. So with multimedia and with social media, they can do great things. But then there's also this unprotected and uncorroborated, just vicious element of, of social media. It's a dangerous, dangerous arena. And these first ladies are, are right smack dab in the middle of it. You gave as... I'm not sure how many people, how many of our listeners know this, but you also gave the commencement speech for the class of 2018. Correct. Um, and in that speech, you made the joke that there's no being a first lady 101 class. So <laughs> right. here's, a kind, here's a kind of goofy question. If there was a class and you could choose one first lady from any time in history to come back and teach the class, which one would you choose? Oh, Ben, you've done it. You've asked me a question that no one else has ever asked me. Um, good job. Good job on you. Like I say, you're hired. You're looking for something out of college. First ladies, man. Because here's a little something. I, I have full plans of intending. I've written the textbooks. I would like to offer the first ladies experience, first ladies 101, first ladies 102, volume one and volume two, as an online college class. I think it's something that people need to know, and they need to know how influential and powerful and, and useful uh, and, and intelligent uh, these these women are and what they've done and continue to do in that role. That being said, uh, I'd be I'd be a fool not to pick Lou Hoover. She spoke seven different languages and most of those were self-taught. I'm going to I'm going to go outside the box a little bit and I'm going to pick one first lady from each century. And from the 1700s, I'm going to pick Abigail Adams to teach that First Ladies 101. Abigail Adams would be a progressive thinker in today's time. She had reasonable answers and thoughts about things that we haven't been able to solve today. Gender equality, racial equality, religious equality. I, she, her, her thinking was just so far ahead of her time, it's almost mind boggling. In the 1800s, I'll pick Lucy Hayes. Lucy Hayes did things before women were expected, allowed, uh, the work that she did researching medical facilities, mental institutions, veterans uh, facilities that she did for her husband to come back and say, this needs to be fixed or this needs to be repeated and emulated. I had also our first first lady with a college degree, uh, Lucy Webb Hayes. She had a, a humbleness to her that was remarkable. B beautifully intelligent woman, Lucy Hayes. So I would pick Lucy Hayes. Then for the 1900s, I would go, I would go Lou Hoover. Oh, God, man, a, a, a close second would be Betty Ford. Uh, Betty Ford, just, just what a remarkable human being. She tackled things publicly that affect every single human being on earth, indirectly or directly, in one way, shape, or form. That's probably the strongest woman I've ever met. I met her when I was young and, and probably the, the, the strongest woman to be in, in, in the White House or First Lady. I, that, that alone in itself. And in the 2000s, to teach that class, Gosh, Laura Bush is a favorite and a and a and a, a, a librarian, an educator, and things. But um, Michelle Obama, as the um, as one of our most educated first lady, she's educational, or she's educated and she's smart. And there's a difference. You can be educated but not be too terribly smart. Michelle Obama seems to have both, and she would be my pick to teach that class in the 2000s. All right, so we're running out of time. So I just have one last question for you. And it's a question that I'm asking everyone that I interview during this quarantine time. Of course, you're the first. So the question is, most people are at home for the foreseeable future. 
And it sounds, at least from the other from the other high schoolers that I've talked to, that most people are doing three things: rating books, eating food, and watching TV and movies. So <laughs> we need your suggestion, and feel free to use this as a shameless plug for your own work. We need your <laughs> suggestion of one thing to read, one thing to eat, and one thing to watch during this time that we're at home. I got you covered, Ben. The one thing to read would, of course, be Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1 and 2, available in paperback, hardback, personally signed copies, Kindle, if that's the way you want to go, e-reader, iBook, all can be purchased and found at firstladiesman.com. I encourage everyone to do so. I'd be happy to sign books for everyone listening. As far as to eat, I'm going to tell you what I made for lunch yesterday. And this is healthy, and it's fun, and it's tasty. And you can take any one or two of the elements out and make substitutions. I made a hard-boiled egg sandwich on Italian bread. And it was Italian bread, mayonnaise, dill, black pepper, fresh avocado, freshly cooked bacon, and three hard-boiled eggs. Oh, and provolone cheese. Smashed it all down together with a side of avocado and sour cream and onion potato chips. And it was delightful. It was refreshing. It was filling. Like I say, healthy, full of protein. And not horrible for you, but it still tasted uh, decadent. So there's my there's my recipe for what I've been eating, and I will repeat that sandwich multiple times in the near future. Two things, two things that I watched recently. Um, I jumped on the Ozark train, albeit a little bit late, on Netflix, and it was remarkably entertaining and so well acted and written. I couldn't say enough nice things that if you like the um, Quentin Tarantino uh, aspect of life, which I happen to enjoy, I watched a series on USA Today called Briar Patch with Rosario Dawson. And it was it was wild. It was wacky. It had everything that I like in, in entertainment and television series. So there's my recommendations. And, and just, I hope, you know, thank you for your interest in me. Thank you for all your time. Thank you for your remarkably uh, insightful questions and the research that you did to interview me. It was a truly remarkable job. And I wish for, for everyone, uh, not only just Rockville High School, their friends and families of which I still have so many ties to, um, but I wish everyone just safe and happy and, and healthy existence uh, through this uh, coronavirus and beyond. And I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to be a guest. I'm sure that I definitely learned a lot and I did research on you for the interview. So <laughs> I'm sure that our listeners learned a lot as well. I look forward to ordering your book. It's one of the things that's on my mind. And so I hope that you managed to stay safe, that you can keep working during this coronavirus time. Thank you so much for your time. Ben, thanks so much, and please stay in touch. I greatly appreciate you. A final thank you to Mr. Andrew Oak for being the guest on our podcast today. And I would like to thank all of you guys for listening in. Remember that we have regular articles going up on the website, and also there will be a couple more episodes of the podcast coming your way. So stay tuned, stay safe. Thank you.